I'd like to talk about the work with Peter because it was a kind of research agenda. Uh, and um, now there's another aspect of my practice that, uh, and thinking and teaching that I should mention, and that is the many long years of working with Peter Eisenman on projects. Peter's an architect who is fairly famous for being uh, involved in theory and especially uh, post-structural theory, deconstruction theory, other theories, and who uh, is admired and feared and loathed by people in architecture because he is such a, a rhetorician and theoretical force. Um, and I ended up uh, being introduced to him by, of all people, Jack Robertson, and uh, on a competition in Portland, Oregon. And we didn't win that competition, but it was for a public square that someone else got. Larry Halpern didn't win it either. <laughs> But one of the things about that was we had fun, and I found him kind of interesting uh, in his uh, rigorousness. And he had been very interested in, he'd, he'd got a PhD from Cambridge University. With his his uh, thesis was on Tarani, a uh, architect from the 1930s who worked for the fascist regime in, in Italy, but who was a brilliant uh, architect that many architects I knew were very interested in. And Peter, is, is a true intellectual uh, of the old school. And he, uh, interestingly enough, after that project, we kind of got along and had fun teasing each other, but after that project, he called me and asked me about doing some work, and we subsequently did about 25 or more projects over the next 20-some years. And um, I think by now we've only got maybe two, two and a half built. There's a big one under construction in Spain right now, uh, in uh, Santiago de Compostela, that everyone will go and say, ooh, ah, you know, and whatever. Uh, but it's, it's um, and they'll think it's all about buildings, but actually <laughs> it's, it's something else. It's something that Peter and I were both very interested in, and that is we're interested in other sources of form, and we're interested in why people didn't understand that there was a continuum between landscape and architecture and that it might actually produce, if you wanted to experiment, it might produce work that where you could not separate them because the architecture was the building, the building was the architecture, it was all a continuum. And that interested us to the point that we, when I was at Harvard, teaching at Harvard, uh, and took over the chair. The next year, Peter came in to be a visitor, and we did a competition at Ohio State University, and we won it, which was the Wexner Center. And it is truly a thing where the building and the landscape are totally interrelated. We started in my office, uh, and because he didn't have an office, and you know, we'd sit there with a little bottle of scotch and a couple of TAs, and. and uh, work on the project, and once it became something that had to be drafted up and worked on in Miles Belt, we moved it to Peter's office in New York, and a couple of guys from my office would go up and work in his office on it. We won that competition, and it was a lot of fun, but it would also had ideas about place, it had ideas about uh, how one might uh, deal with memory in a, in a physical form that wasn't uh, that was both abstract but also was accessible, I believe. It 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 had to do with the the demolition of an armory. It had to do with the Jefferson grid across the Midwest. It had to do with the lost prairie that was gone. And for me, it also had to do with kind of memories of Etruscan tombs, and you know, and you know, and for him, it was a kind of rational structuralist grid. And, you know, and dealing with the ghost of Tarani. So we brought our personal agendas, but then we grounded it in, a, in an actual place with events from that site. And it absolutely shocked people. They were, uh, the chairman of the Landscape Architecture Department of Ohio State tried to get my license revoked in landscape architecture. He was so offended by it. And because, you know, I, we were doing these big tip planes with prairie grasses and stuff, and, you know, he was offended because it, the, it, the landscape wasn't supine, the lawn wasn't behaving itself like a nice mat for the building to sit on. 
it just, we had broken all the rules of decorum in the Midwest about how buildings and site relate to each other. And, you know, I was absolutely thrilled that you could do something that would upset people that way. I mean, I felt, well, this may not be the right of spring in Stravinsky, but, you know, damn it, art really still does affect people. They, they don't know what to do about it, especially if it's taking them somewhere out of their comfort zone they've never been that has ideas. So Peter and I then spent many years working on projects, almost all in competitions. <laughs> we, we did a house, we did a design for Les Wexner for Palm Beach, and he, after he looked at the drawings and Peter presented it to him, he said, where's the house? <laughs> so, that didn't happen. That's when you know, I guess this job's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> but anyway, um, we, we had some, some great uh, experience. But one of the things that happened was, you see, on a couple of projects, I, I had written a piece called Form, Meaning, and Expression in Landscape Architecture for Landscape Journal, which has now been many years ago. But is it, I hate to say it, seminal piece that's led to a lot of theory and, uh, and anti-theory and foolish writing. But one of the things that I said in that was that there is this limited uh, vocabulary of forms, a lot of them coming out of Greco-Roman civilization having to do with Euclidean geometry that have basically formed most of the design uh, vocabulary of Western public space and town planning. And that in this era, you know, in an age after 20th century art and after, you know, the, you know, the atomic revolution and the discovery of relativity and ecology and everything, that surely that there must be other sources of form that one would use to organize projects. And I was curious what those might be. And which ones might be fruitful and which ones would just be silly or they'd lead to dysfunctional places or, you know, like the house Peter did where there's a column where the bed should be and no one can figure out how to live in it. And that's what it so, I mean, some explorations of form are not fruitful, you know, but some are very, some are. And I also, there, at that point in urban design, there was a, a kind of two camps of uh, contextualism, uh, and, and the kind of new urbanism was emerging, and then there was also uh, a whole group that from Creer, that, that's a kind of Leo Creer group, but they were heavily influenced by earlier Camilo Cite and some of the, the picturesque town planning ideas of the turn of the century, as opposed to, say, uh, a more mechanistic and uh, functionalist uh, camp that one might attribute to, say, uh, the Bauhaus or to uh, Team 10 or some of the groups that came out of a European tradition in town planning. And so I was interested if, is there something beside figure ground relationships or picturesqueness? What other sort of fundamental starting points are there for urbanization in terms of uh, large compositional organization. And I thought maybe biology uh, would be a good place to start or modern physics or chemistry. And so Peter, that was cool with him because he was very interested in uh, a lot of the philosophical uh, developments that had come out of France and, and particularly uh, Derrida and some other people who he knew and was friendly with. But uh, he also, you know, th there, there were some other people. So when the competition for Rebstock Park in uh, Frankfurt came up and we entered that and ended up on the shortlist and then eventually won the competition, um, it was be it, part of what got us started was uh, James Gleick had just published his uh, work on chaos theory and uh, the book on chaos theory, and in which he ha had meant, he mentioned uh, Seymour Mandelbrot, who, you know, was the father of fractal geometry. And fractal geometry, the notion of things nesting in scale, in an ascending or descending order, was very interesting to us because we could see that that was something that you could find in architecture and planning in many ways. And so, so. Peter and I began looking at how we might use, uh, how we could use some of these concepts 
and how they might translate into what we could draw, what we could make, what forms they would generate. And he also, at about that time, was getting starting to get some computers and some bright guys who could use computers and various programs. And there was a couple of programs where you can kind of distort things, you know. You could morph things around. So we, we took a couple of ideas, uh, the, the le pli, the fold, the concept of the fold, which is actually a, central to a certain aspect in chaos theory where there's a tipping point and things change. So we, we looked at a couple of concepts like that and to see what they do, and we took our site, and it was right next to a project by Ernst May, the great German uh, housing uh, planner from the pre-war era, uh, and th so there was an Ernst May housing project right next to our site with these kind of bar buildings with the community gardens and everything, and then there were some Schweber gardens, you know, what, what we call allotment gardens. Uh, uh, on the site, and the site had been heavily bombed during the war uh, by the Eighth Air Force and the British Air Force, and uh, it was it had been a, a, an air base, and then it was obliterated. And then after the war, they tried to clean it up mostly, but it just remained open. And they used it for public parking for the Frankfurt Fair, uh, for the mess. Uh, and they also uh, started mining it for gravel, and they had people do drivers' tests on it. And it was a kind of goofy site. But the Batella Institute was also there. And Batella Institute was the institute that somehow survived Nazi Germany and was a post-war think tank which had nuclear scientists in it. And there was a, also a little cyclotron or some darn thing. So there's a kind of oddball site, big. And so we basically laid a grid out, extrapolated stuff from the Ernst May project, and then began to distort it and play with it and overlay it with ideas of, from ecology about airflow because um, Bernard Lassus had done a plan for the Grüner Belt around it, which was, had to do with the green belt around the city and how air could come from the Taunus Mountains down into the city at night. And I was interested in how to pull that through this site, through certain formal structures and arrangements of trees and landform and buildings. But also I was interested in how one might produce a landscape that was productive landscape that could also double as overflow parking at certain seasons and other times produce cash crops of flowers or something like that that would be helpful to the park system and the people there. And then finally, how we could get water back into the groundwater table and produce habitat and produce gardens and recreation and all the housing. And so, so basically, that project was a, the kind of project that Peter and I did for years. We kept doing projects where we would try to see how much we could stuff into the project, but in alternative devices through formal exploration. So it was kind of an R&D adventure for me for many years. We didn't get a lot built. Uh, the last episode of that probably is the Memorial for the Murdered Jews of Europe which is its own tale. The Memorial for the Murdered Jews of Europe was started by uh, Richard Serra and Peter Eisenman on their own as a competition. They got into the shortlist and they were sailing along and then they started having problems figuring out how to build it and Peter called me and said, can you come help? And I said, of course. Because I don't believe that anyone, everyone should be the full author of everything all the time. You should help your friends. You know, other people have good ideas. You should help them with their ideas. It doesn't have to always be your idea. So I went to help Peter. And uh, part of the problem was it's, it's, it's a fabulous project that I care deeply about. I, I was part of the generation that, as a child, learned about Nazi Germany. And by the time I was in junior high and high school, we were get, seeing the movies from the death camps that absolutely stunned us. And I know that if I'd been in Germany at the time, even though I'm not Jewish, I would have been sent off too, because I'm not their kind of guy. <laughs> but anyway, um, and so I, and I, I feel very powerfully moved by the tragedy and the horror of it, and uh, I, I wanted to help them. So there were a couple of simple problems. One was, they had an idea, a topographic idea, and a notion of the replication of things, basically a grid gone mad. You know, the notion of rational things becoming irrational, and of this deadliness of it all. And the, it was a brilliant scheme. 
it was the best of both Peter and Richard. And in the course of doing it, I ended up trying to help him, and I did, figure out how we would handle the ground plane and how we'd make it so that it, it could percolate water and not, A, not get water coming up, get water going down, and, how, and working with Burrow Happel, the engineers, but also how to build it, because, you know, Peter had built a lot. <laughs> And, uh, and also how to deal with the German Senate who were losing their courage at a certain point and everybody was sniping at them. And I had to go spend some time with the German Senate and a couple of the committee members. And with the, they sent the engineer and me in because they felt we were less problem and we would be more rational and, and could coax them along because Peter just scared them. And, and in the course of it, uh, something else happened. Uh, there was pressure from various people to put a register of names in a historic archive there. And Peter said, sure, he could do it. And Sarah got very upset and started squaring and screaming, claiming that Peter was being a fucking architect and that, you know, he was, as usual, selling out and blah, blah, blah. And this was, you know, you know, as an artist, he couldn't put up with that. And Peter said, no, but we don't have to express it. It can be underground. We can deal with it. And, but Sarah was so upset about it, he quit. So then it was just Peter and I getting it built. And, um, and so we, we did. We figured out you know, how we'd bury it. There'd be this, you know, one of the slots, instead of being the great stelas, would just be a stare down. And, and it's really scary. When you go down there, I mean, you go down there and there's the archive and there's the names. People know it's very somber and it's, you, know, you can do your business. But you, you are like getting buried alive when you go there. And when you come back, you look up and you just see the sky, and it's really like oh, you know coming back into the world. It's really very moving. But that that project, what it does is it it is a horrible project. Uh, I mean, in the way that it is chilling, it's numbing, uh, and it 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 the mechanical quality of it going. It's a landscape, but it's a landscape of death, and it's a landscape of madness. And it's a landscape of mechanical reproduction of a repeated act. And it's horrible. And, it's, and, it, and it, I like it. To say I like it, that's a funny way to put it. Why I think it's good is because it's so abstract. And yet, everybody who goes there gets it. They, they understand. They're moved. They they will tentatively go part way in or not. They may some go all the way down. But it gets scarier and creepier the further you go into it. It's very moving. Uh, and, you know, we went to a lot of trouble not to have inscriptions, not to have signs, not to have very much of anything. I mean, I had to fight to get a bus stop, you know, I mean, because, but we wanted to keep it just very pure. I did want to do one more thing, which was interesting. I wanted to do a big row, a double row of conifers along the street facing the tear garden. So there's, on the street there are the lindens, the tilia, you know, the balm that you find on all the street tree, streets there that are mandated by the city planning. And the sidewalk uh, is by code. It's an ordinary German side, Berlin sidewalk. But then our project slides through that and slides out, you know, slides out of it. And what happens is I wanted to have this wall of trees that you could sort of see through diagonally, and then you step through into this world. <laughs> the German Senate forbid us from using the conifers because they said they were like Tannenbaum Christmas trees. And they didn't want them there associated with that. They thought it would be confusing. And I argued, and I said, but wait, the death camps were all in the forest, and they were in the woods of Treblinka and, you know, Dachau and all these places, you know, you know, um, Birkenau, you know, you name them, you know, Buchenwald. They're all in the forest, and I think going into the forest is proper. And they said, no, 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 it's too, that's a Christian thing, it confuses it, blah, blah, blah. So I said, okay. <laughs> 